This is the Your Kick-Ass Life Podcast, episode 34, with guest Amy Pearson. All links and resources you hear in this episode can be found at yourkickasslife.com forward slash 34. This is the Your Kick-Ass Life Podcast with Andrea Owen, a no BS guide to self-help and badassery. Because ladies, let's face it, life's too short for it to not kick ass. And here's your host. The girl who serves it up straight with a side of crazy, Andrea Owen. Hey there, ass kickers. Andrea Owen here wanting to introduce to you our guest for episode 34. It is my friend and colleague, Amy Pearson. Amy Pearson is a master certified Martha Beck life coach, a coach mentor, and instructor for Martha Beck's life coach training. She's a teacher, coach, writer, and speaker. A former approval addict with the occasional relapse, she is now addicted to her success. Her mission is nothing short of world peace by empowering every heart-centered entrepreneur to magnify their tribe, make great money, and an epic impact while doing their unique thing in the world. Here we are, everybody, episode 34 with my lovely friend and colleague, Amy Pearson. So say hi, Amy. Hi, everybody. Yay. I like to do a lot of little songs on my podcast. (laughs) (laughs) I'm good with that. Sing songy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Let's, you know, everyone's met you. They know, they know where you are. They know who you are. So can you first, we'll start, start this off, kick it off by telling us a little bit about your background and story. So how did you become an expert in this area? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, I guess it started out that, um, I was always, what I affectionately think of myself as a gold star chaser. Um, and this was something that I, I did habitually. Um, it started out when I was younger and it just kind of went, I, it just kind of was something I did. And, and basically what I mean is that I used to, um, try to be the best. I tried to achieve. I tried to, um, always just be chasing gold stars. I call this the, um, a, a performer because, I created a, um, a quiz um, to, to, for people to kind of find out how um, approval addiction can manifest depending on the person because it's different depending on the person. But for me, I was a performer. And so I had really spent my entire adult life chasing gold stars. And um, <laughs> I remember as an adult, I was, I, I had, um, at the time I decided I was going to be a policy research analyst because I wanted to solve the hunger problem. And you know, part of that was because I am a woman on a mission and I do want to make a difference. But honestly, part of it was because I wanted people <laughs> to say things like, there goes Amy Pearson well, as I was walking down the street. What? How does she look so good? How does she do all that and stay so thin? <laughs> you know, something like that. Like, I just had fantasies about that. And it's pretty <laughs> embarrassing to admit. But, um, you know, so there was th- that element of it. And I remember um, at this this one point in my life, it's like there's that Oprah expression where she says, you know, life tries to get your attention and it starts out as a whisper. Um, and it, if you're not listening, it gets louder and louder until it hits you like a brick on the head. And I was always too busy, you know, chasing gold stars to, to be listening to the universe. So um, I remember I was uh, working at, on a report on the home about the home mortgage interest rate deduction. I was preparing this intricate uh, Excel spreadsheet for the Oregon legislator. And at that time I was six months pregnant with twins and I had, um, my brother came to the house and it was really strange that he had come to the house, but he came to tell me that our mother was in the hospital. And, um, to make a long story short, she died of heart failure when I was pregnant with my twins, um, six months pregnant. And it was sort of that moment in your life where, you know, I remember three months later the babies were born and I had tried for six years to get them. And, Everything felt like I was walking through fog because I had these brand new babies. It was nothing like I had imagined. Mm -hmm. And then I had lost my mother, who was really my number one fan up to that point. And I felt like I was walking through fog, except for one thing became really crystal clear to me. And that was that I hated my life. I didn't care about the whole mortgage interest rate deduction. I really didn't care about the Oregon legislator or even the price of gasoline, for that matter. I... All I really wanted to do was read self-help books. And it wasn't just self-help. I wanted to read full-out woo-woo books about 
past life regression and near death experience and angelic mm-hmm. encounters and so mm-hmm. you know up to that point it was sort of like i would never allow myself i don't think i had ever read a self help title i i just smart people didn't do that and so um i just kind of allowed myself to go on this i had just given up and i allowed myself to go on this full out uh self help book reading frenzy and one book led to the next and i was introduced to martha beck's work and and she's my mentor and i now train on behalf of her but if you were to ask me sort of what was it you know that really if i had to like point to one thing that really underscored that transformation um it was all about n- creating an inside that was so sparkly and shiny that it didn't matter what it looked like on the outside um because yeah. up to that point i was working so hard to maintain this exterior that was sparkly and shiny so that i could feel worthy and safe in the world and so um really that was the 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 change that got me into kind of examining that dynamic which led me to start writing about uh my journey as a as a approval addict which then led me to my business now which is all about embracing the other side of that which to me is about living brazen being 100% you no apologies uncensored mm-hmm. Wow, I love that. I I really love that. I never I never heard that story about how you grew up and I mm-hmm. love the term star chaser and mm-hmm. when you first said it, I thought you meant like stars like dream chaser but you meant like gold stars. <laughs> yeah, like gold stars like the kind of stars you stick on your yes. uh, achievement chart. <laughs> that was me too and I for yeah. me mine just got worse as the years went by and so tell so you talked about so it's basically seeking approval and I know that you you talk about something called the approval trap. So mm-hmm. what is that exactly? Yeah, so I like to um even though I've lost my mom I I typically use her a lot when I'm talking about this stuff. Um and I remember when I was little um she was really neurotic and we'd go to the beach and she'd say don't she wouldn't let us go past her ankles and if we ever did she would she'd say swim sideways if we ever got caught in a rip tide she'd say swim sideways that was her advice so i like to talk about i share a story when it comes to kind of describing the approval trap because i never had any accidents in the ocean but i did once almost die while i was whitewater rafting with my husband we got stuck in the spot it was just the two of us on this raft and we got stuck in the spot where um we fell and i immediately got sucked underneath the water and i was um being i was sort of pinned in this like circular uh motion i think they call it a rip uh what do they call rip it a pressure wave oh okay and and i was stuck there and i couldn't see anything and i had my life jacket on and i i definitely could not swim sideways i knew if i i stayed like that i was going to drown and so i just remembered my mom's advice and so I did what was really counterintuitive but I immediately took off my life jacket and as soon as I did um I was able to swim sideways and I was able to see the surface of the water and I was able to get to the to the surface of the water um but the reason I like that story to kind of illustrate or demonstrate um what I mean by the the approval trap is that when we're you know what happens is that we pick up on these ideas that there are parts of us that are not fit for human consumption so sort of like we just for whatever reason have to hide them and we put on this um facade this exterior that we think is um it, you know for women it's usually some combination of likable humble attractive you know perfect um all of that and then um we hide be- behind that because we think it keeps us safe but really what it does is it keeps us trapped and it keeps us in this vicious cycle um and what we need to do in order to be free and to really um have our needs met and feel safe in the world counterintuitively is we have to drop that facade and we have to allow whatever it is hiding underneath to to be able to be free and so that's when we can start to see clearly that's when we can escape Um but in in essence it's really this this idea that there's parts of us we have to hide in order to feel safe and then we put those behind a facade and for me I call myself a performer it sounds like that's something that you kind of have as well but it really do- it's not just about people pleasing or getting approval it it actually does manifest differently um depending on the person some people are helpers i have one category even called haters i have um tough gals and chameleons and perfectionists so um but whatever it is we put that on to hide parts of ourselves and what happens is we do that because there's this really primal need for us to feel a sense of belonging and connectedness 
But we think that we have to hide ourselves in order to get that, when in essence what we're doing is we're sacrificing ourselves for this false sense of belonging because no one can really truly know you if you're hiding beneath a facade. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, a thousand percent to everything that you said. And <laughs> And I, I, I know that a lot of people listening to this are, are like nodding. And <laughs> but yeah, like Brene Brown says, and we, we put ourselves into either pleasing, perfecting, um, pleasing, perfecting, I f even forget, there's like two more Ps, but yeah. it's, it's really, it's about, I, I, I love what, that you said that we think that that's the way to belong and really mm -hmm. it's, it's so we're shooting ourselves in the foot basically is what I'm yeah. trying to say. And I remember when you were saying that, I remember one of my first kind of, uh, I don't know if it's like first memory, but I definitely remember uh, an example of when I, when my parents got divorced when I was 18, it was right after I had graduated high school. My mom waited until after my graduation to leave. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I was an only child. I have, I have half siblings, but they were much older. They were out of the house by the time I was in kindergarten. So I essentially grew up an only child and, and, it fell apart and I was totally taken off guard. Like I didn't even know that they were even having problems. No one let me in on it. So I got the rug pulled out from under me and, and I remember they sent me to a therapist, which is funny because she's still my therapist to this day, 22 oh, years wow. later. <laughs> yeah. I haven't been seeing her the whole time on and off, yeah. but I still, I even wrote her in my acknowledgments, but I sat in her office at 18 years old in like my bongo outfit. I totally remember even like what I was wearing and, and she was like, and I, I remember telling myself before I went in that I wasn't going to cry. Like that was my goal. Mm -hmm. My goal was not to, you know, feel my feelings or get help. It was like, I don't want anyone to know that this is affecting yeah. me in any way. And I kept saying like, I'm fine. It's really, it's okay. And I remember considering it, like sitting in her office, like she seems cool. Like she doesn't seem like a psychiatrist. Like mm -hmm. she's just drinking tea. Like we're sitting on the couch and, but I was like, no, I am not. Like, watch how tough I am. And then what was interesting is that, tell me, tell me what you think about this, because I think this happens a lot to women, is that I got praise from other people for being so strong. Right. So I was like, okay, that's what you want me to do? Then I will do more of that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. I mean, I, I use this term uh, addiction, and I'm pretty deliberate about that, um, because I think what happens is we, you know, the behaviors that we use – um, we become, in, in, in essence, sort of addicted to them because at, at the root of all of this is this, this feeling that in order to be safe, um, we need, we can't, we're not safe being who we are. Um, but what happens, like, if you think about, like, drinking, I mean, there's a hangover or, you know, like, you've got lots of, like, you, you've got to deal with the mess afterwards or whatever. And if you're smoking, it's like, you, you, you know, you, you get the, get the teeth and the, you know, there's the, it's on mm -hmm. your clothes. And, you know, if you spend too much money, it's like, if you have a shopping addiction, it's like there, it's very clear that, you know, you see the consequences on your credit card um, statement. But when you're um, kind of addicted to behaviors that um, get you praise or at, at the very least avoiding rejection, it's like the, the direct positive consequence is praise or right. you know at least you're not ruffling any feathers or you know you're not dealing with any any conflict and so it's really hard for us and this is kind of why I'm on a crusade to to, to have a conversation about this um, especially among women is that we have this idea that somehow if we're praised if we're getting positive feedback we're being good and we're doing the right thing right and you can waste your entire life I know I almost did waste my entire adult, my, I, I wasted my 30s and my 20s just doing good, like doing a good job. But it was not my standards. It was, I was essentially, it was a moving target because everybody thinks different things about what good means. But for me, it was like, I had no idea like why, even though I was doing good, I was looking good, I was mm -hmm. acting good. I still felt so miserable and I felt so ashamed for being miserable. And I thought the answer was to keep working harder, harder. to mm -hmm. be better. Yeah. I'm glad that you said that too, like that you felt ashamed for feeling miserable because I've, yeah. I thought I could not figure out, and I, I, I found this to be the case with a lot of women is that they keep asking like, what is wrong with me? 
Yeah. Like, why don't I feel good? Like I have all these things. Like I have yeah. a marriage and a and a great job and these kids and I live in this great city and I'm in my community and I I can't figure out what it is. Yeah. And I I have been there. Like I and then I think what might start to happen is that you blame everybody else. Yes. Well, yeah. You know, like if you were better and oh maybe it's my parents' fault and maybe it, that's what I did for years. I mean that was yeah. my twenties. Yeah. And then and then it manifested into an eating disorder and too much drinking and codependency and yeah. so you know that's a perfect segue for my next question is how do people know if they have a problem? Well, you know, um, I want to address that because a resentment is a big one. I mean, oh, that yeah. is a big red flag. <laughs> <laughs> um, because, um, and I know, yeah, we've had the conversation about resentment, but if you're, you know, if you're a woman and you're working really hard, however that looks for you to be good, then damn it, you know, somebody better notice that mm. or somebody better, you know, reciprocate or, you know, or heads are and, roll. And, and so there's a lot of resentment because we're not, um, we're not getting what we think we're supposed to be getting back mm. or put And then, you know, because we're working so hard to, to, um, you know, um, let's see, we're changing our behaviors, we're making decisions, we're, we're creating an entire life that doesn't fit us, also that we can get what we think we need from other people. Um, but what happens is we don't. We can, we, we can never do that because we can never tr- control how other people behave. Mm-hmm. Um, so <laughs> that's, a, that's a big one. Resentment is a big one. Yeah. Um, and, you know, a lot of it is about thinking that we can control what we can. Um, control is a huge one. Um, and the, the reality is, is like, no matter how great your outfit is, or no matter how mon- much money you make, or no matter how much weight you lose, or how articulate you just were in that conversation, <laughs> you know, um, you you know, you can never control how someone else is going to respond to you. Mm-hmm. It's just out of your hands. Um, but that's what we do. And so a lot of times um, it can manifest into a, obsessive thinking. It could be like going into a situation or it, often it's it's both. It's going into a situation or it can be, you know, after sort of that constant uh, replay that you do in your head about what you could have said or what you should have done. Or, you know, there's always something that you could have done or said um, better. Um, there's always like, you know, it's, and, and the other thing, too, is if this is resonating um, with people, I would really encourage you to go and check out um, my approval qu- quiz. It's at approvalquiz.com because the other thing that I've noticed is um, there there is literature out there about, um, you know, wanting approval or being a people pleaser. But we're all different. And But I think what is at the root of all of this is fundamentally not feeling safe, being yourself. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it can manifest as well. I never want someone to see that I'm actually um, vulnerable or that I need help or that, you know, I don't ever want anyone to see me cry. And that would be more of that tough guy, tough gal persona versus, you know, other people who are obsessively trying to make everything come out perfect, even though it doesn't actually exist, so that no one can criticize them or reject them reject them. So, you know, it's, and for me, I was the one who always had to be the best and always like, there was this weird, like balancing act between being the best, but not letting people feel uncomfortable by me being the best. Mm -hmm. So it's it's different (laughs) depending on the person. Um, and so I would go in and if this resonates and you want to find out kind of how this might be manifesting for you, go to approvalquiz.com. Um, take that quiz because that'll that'll shine a little bit more light on how it's showing up specifically for you. Yeah, you know it's funny. I was laughing because like that was that was the kind of the trajectory of my own personal growth. Like I, you know, I was a mess, and then I started to get better, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is such a better life, and oh oh my gosh, and then and then I started to get kind of like really really into my personal development journey, and then I was like, wait a minute, I don't want to shine too bright. Yeah, I don't want to make other people uncomfortable. Okay, am I too? Am I too much? Am I too? Oh wait, oh wait. Do you want me to? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, me too. It was sort of like madness making. It's like, okay, um, I really like. For me, I was like, I don't know how I did this, but it was like simultaneously trying to be win every award and get every grant and always, you know, look the best. But then I always had to like somehow undercut myself because yeah. I never wanted anyone to feel uncomfortable in my presence. Right. <laughs> like, let's just not talk about my awards. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had to always like do something that, you know, just to, just to undercut myself, just a tad. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. I totally get it. So, um, how do, how does, cause I know that 
this, all of this work, you know, it, it, like you were saying, like it can manifest in different ways. So how do you, cause I know a lot of my listeners also deal with perfectionism. So how does perfectionism fit in with all of this? Yeah. And you know, Brene Brown, we can't really talk about this without talking about her. Um, but she, she talks about perfectionism. I think she says it's something like a 20, 20 2010 shield armor. that you, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> you look around and, and that's what perfectionism is. Um, it's, it's like this thing, this thing that we do, um, because we think if we can just get it perfect enough, then we'll stay safe. And, you know, sometimes it's it's not about getting approval. It's the other side of the coin. It's about avoiding rejection mm-hmm. um, because we don't want anyone, to, we don't want to ever have anybody roll their eyes or, or say, who does she think she is or, or you know, just, um, you know, reject us or judge us or criticize us. And so perfectionism is a way that we think we're keeping ourselves bulletproof in that way. Um, when really it's, it's all just madness making again, because there's really not, there's really no such thing as perfect. Right. Yeah. I, I can, I hear that. That's what I wanted to say. It's, it's true. It is such a false way of, it's really, it's a mask that, that, you know, I did the same thing for years that I put over myself and, and was like, okay, so if nobody, I don't want anyone to see the, see the real me, which really was just a human being. It yeah. was just like everybody else. Like, yeah. I think that as a perfectionist, I made up that my messy parts of my life were way worse and way uglier than anybody else's. Mm-hmm. And that was not true. I yeah. Don't know. Well, and it's a form of um, black or white thinking because mm-hmm. we, you know, we, we, there are all kinds of, you know, we get bombarded with all of these messages about, you know, what the ideal woman is like and what she has to look like and what she has to wear and what she has to say and do. And then we hold ourselves up to that standard. And when we see that we fall short, then we feel like we need to work to be, you know, we need to work to to match that standard. But, you know, there's really no such, I mean, it's like, it's, it's all black or white thinking. And in reality, I mean, there, there's no such thing as this inferiority or, or superiority. I think that's kind of like what, um, you know, that, that, that term having an inferiority complex is about, you know, it's like trying to chase superiority when it's all just, um, all just black or white, you know, there's really not, no such thing as that black or white kind of reality anyway. Yeah. It's interesting. I was reading something about, um, I'm sure you're familiar with this. So there's like this new trend of bloggers. Well, it's not like a new trend, but what's getting really popular is um, like blogs like Scary Mommy and Baby Rabies and stuff like that, where it's like these moms talking about the worst part of parenting and Mm -hmm. like, oh, my kids are assholes. And, you know, they're just like out there letting it all hang out about like the messy and ugly side of parenting. And it's for entertainment purposes, mostly, you know, they're just, they're funny. And then, um, you know, and they're always bagging and bashing on like the Pinterest moms who are like, you know, like make the crafts and the elf on the shelf and everything like that. And so there's these two extremes and I was reading, it may have been like Glennon over at mom mastery was talking about like, like how it makes her uncomfortable. Like there's like one or the other. I can't remember where I heard it, but Mm. I was talking to a friend about it and I was, I was saying like, I think that most, the majority of us are Mm -hmm. somewhere in the middle and that those two are, it's very black or white. Like those two different types, those are the extremes and that's really not what their lives look like. Like the Pinterest moms that make everything look perfect they also have marriage problems and they, you know, are emotional eaters, like all the same shit that we all deal with. Yeah. And then the moms that, that are the scary mommies, like they still like, you know, have vulnerability stuff and still love their kids just as much as we do. Yeah. So I think that, but, but like you were saying, like it puts pressure on us to be one or the other. And mm-hmm. I always like to remind myself and my listeners, like really like, what's we're somewhere in the gray area and I think like you were saying like that dichotomous thinking for me when I started to work on that when I got called out on that by my therapist that was really hard for me to adjust to and I I think every single one of my clients that comes to me deals with that black or white dichotomous thinking gray Uh area is tough yeah it is really tough and it's one of the it's sort of like one of the foundational principles I teach my, um, uh, the, the gals who go through my work is that, you know, really foundational to, um, you know, overcoming your inner approval addict and embracing the other side is really about, um, 
catching yourself in that, catching yourself in the black or white, catching mm-hmm. yourself in the dichotomous thinking. Um, and it's funny because I know I have really come a long way because I have, you know, some family members who very closely <laughs> resemble those Pinterest moms. Mm-hmm. And I used to, when I, I used to compare myself to that, cause I, I'm a mom, I have three small children and, um, I used to feel really bad. In fact, it was like, I was, I was quietly very defensive about that. <laughs> but, you know, um, nowadays it's sort of like, you know, I still have my moments. I'm not going to lie, but, um, I, I, I'm able to see what kind of qualities the you know, my Pinterest family members have. And I'm able to learn from that, you know, where, or where as before I might be defensive and I might go into my mind about like how I need to be that way or how, you know, somehow they're assholes or something like that. Whereas now it's sort of like, okay, um, what is it about this that is triggering me? And where is it that, that they might be doing something that I could actually learn something from? Yeah. Or maybe I just need to chill out, you know? <laughs> um, so I, it's really helpful. I think um, I wasn't planning to talk about dichotomous thinking, but um, being able to notice yourself or catch yourself, because it's super insidious. Intellectually, we know that black, there's you know, no, no such thing as black or white, everything shade of gray. But until you, you know, like really start to watch yourself and notice yourself in it, um, you'll be amazed at how insidious it is. Yeah. Um, and just try to see, see the gray area because you can really learn something there. Yeah. I wrote a chapter in my book about it and the title of it was How a C-plus Day Can Change Your Life. Mm. And I learned that. Um, and I, t- I tell the story in, in the chapter about I went to one of my weekends of coach training and I was distracted the whole weekend because I was getting married the following weekend. And I, I pulled one of the teachers aside and told her and I was agonizing over it. I mm. made up all these stories about how I was going to be a bad coach because I wasn't learning this particular part of the model. And mm. I just couldn't keep – I was just – I was making a huge deal about it. And she looked at me for a second and she goes, what if you just had a C-plus weekend instead of an A-plus weekend? Yeah. <laughs> and like that sounded crazy to me. Of course, my inner critic was like, What? <laughs> Yeah. But just like sitting in that and yeah. and, and having permission because I think that that's what a lot of it is is like yeah. I think that there's so much power too in saying those things out loud to another person yeah. and whether it's a coach or whether it's just your best trusted most trusted friend oh you know like just saying like I really am putting a ton of pressure on myself about this project at work or my parenting you yeah. know and just having someone else echo it back to you and say you're doing a great job what if you just let yourself off the hook for like today well, it's, that's the thing, like that C plus day or, you know, um, it's, it, it's, it, it is everything. I mean, I, I know like for me, like a big part of this whole, like the, all of the, all of the approval trap is all about like not accepting who you are underneath this sparkly, shiny facade mm-hmm. or this perfectionist. And it's like, we, we work so hard. I mean, you can literally exhaust yourself. And that's another um, trait of approval addicts is that they're exhausted. Um, and, you know, you can literally just, ex- it's exhausting. And, you know, what was the most liberating for me is just to allow myself to be who I am in all my messy glory. And I know like I'm saying this, but it wasn't until I literally got that, that I could just be mediocre, that I could just, you know, just be slight, you know, boring. I could go to bed at eight and that that's who I am. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, that to me has really been everything. Um, and, and, and so it has really changed my life. It has changed my business. And I know this isn't a business conversation, but it was really actually mind blowing to me to see how like allowing who I was, the parts of me that I was trying to hide, like there's this part of me that stutters and there's this part of me that's not very articulate. There's this part of me that forgets words. I'm really, you know, I was working so hard to overcompensate for that mm-hmm. through all this work in policy and all those masks and the master's degree and everything. And underneath was just this person who likes to dance and who's kind of goofy and um, isn't really that interested in current events. <laughs> and yeah. I let her out. And it was so fascinating to see how my life changed, my relationships changed, my business just blew up. It exploded when I could let that come through. And, you know, so it may be a business, it may be a hobby, it may be looking for clarity in terms of what will make you happy, but you've got to un- look, at, you have to allow and give yourself permission um, to look underneath what you're ashamed of. 
-hmm. because a lot of times that's where it's hiding. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, you, you segued beautifully into that, just about being your, your messy self. And so can you talk a little bit about radical authenticity? Yeah. So, um, I looked for a word that I thought kind of embodied the opposite of shame. Um, and, and I found this word brazen Mm -hmm. (laughs) and, you know, I, I really love that as a word to kind of, um, illustrate sort of what the opposite of the approval trap is. But I think when you, you know, a lot of times we, I, I like to, I like to reappropriate that word because it's been used in the past to say like brazen hussy or, you know, oh, she's so, you know, it's like been used in really negative ways. Um, and so that's why I kind of like the Rosie the Riveter image mm-hmm. with like, and I'm just kind of putting this together right now, actually. Um, <laughs> but I like this idea of brazen reappropriating it for women because what I think it, the opposite of the approval trap is about is, is authenticity, but it's radical. It's not just authenticity. It's radical authenticity because every single one of us, no exceptions, um, has something within us that has never existed before and it will never exist again. And there's something about it that I believe can dramatically change someone's life. It could change you know, it, it will introduce some concept or it will make someone think differently or, you know, it will set off like some kind of a uh, some kind of an amazingly transformative shift in, in our world. And, and so I think radical authenticity is about that. If you can really embody brazen being 100 percent you, no apologies, uncentered. There, that's what makes waves. That, that's what shifts the status quo. That's what, um, that's where thought leadership comes in. Uh, and I, I feel really strongly about that, but, um, I've seen it, I've seen it happen over and over again. Um, that when you can embrace that other side, it, it, it is really, um, it is really powerful and it, and it is very transformative for you, but it's also incredibly healing to others outside of yourself. That's true. And I'm glad you said that because I think that, you know, in my own personal development journey, I was, you know, of course, afraid to to be super authentic. And then when it started to happen organically and over time, I was amazed that the, of the ripple effect, like I didn't yeah. realize that, that, yeah. um, you know, I'm not saying like, you know, that you should go out there and do it for other people, but, mm-hmm. but really, you know, you're creating you're, you become a role model for your coworkers, for, especially for your children. Yeah. Um, so I just, again, yeah, it, it can be transformative to you. It will be transformative to you and to, to other people. So I know that you have a free gift. So do you mm. want to tell the listeners about it and how they can get it? And by the way, you guys, um, all links to the show are at your kickass life forward slash three, four. If you're having trouble remembering, um, all the links they're they're in the show notes, your kickass life forward slash three, four will take you right to Amy's show notes where all this stuff can be found. Yeah. Yeah. So I do a series um, called Be Brazen, the Breakthrough Sessions. And it's kind of a fun way to receive coaching via osmosis because I'm um, I'm coaching women who are um, who are sort of um, dealing with a lot of the, the kind of classic um, sort of um, symptoms of approval addiction. And so I'm, I have a series of coaching sessions where I, I have um, the, those those sessions recorded and then um, they're all on a different theme. And so I've taken one of those and it sells on my website for $37, but I wanted to offer it to your people to sort of check it out, get a sense of, you know, um, sort of my work and also receive some coaching by osmosis um, through this through this product. Um, it's also got some great um, tools and tips and um, and um, uh, some other like tools uh, um that are connected with the, with the audio. So you can get that over at, um, livebrazen.com forward slash gift for free. free. (laughs) My gift to you. Thank you. For being Andrea's friend. (laughs) Yes. We love free. Well, I think I should say Andrea's tribe. Andrea's tribe. Yeah. I think it's such a, it's, it's such a great, um, gift because a lot of people, A, don't even know what a coaching session might look like Mm -hmm. and they're not ready to invest. They don't know what it is. So I think it's a great way to, to see firsthand what it is. And because you're right, I think a lot of, a lot of, uh, the women come to 
sessions with the same same staff yeah. and it's interesting yeah. that yeah I just went through all of the intakes that I've ever received from all of my clients mm -hmm. and it was the same patterns it was yeah it was worthiness. It was perfectionism. It was yeah. not feeling enough. So you're not alone if you're listening and, and you yeah. feel like uh, maybe you're not sure exactly what it is, like we were saying earlier in the podcast, but mm -hmm. you know something isn't right. Uh, if you're here and you're listening to this, we probably just spent the last 40 minutes talking about it. So yes. you're in the right place. We need to connect those dots because it's really yeah. hard. It can be really confusing when you're mm -hmm. just getting praise. Right. Exactly. And that's that it was so confusing and conflicting yeah. for me too. And I finally, you know, and, and it doesn't have to be I know, people that have listened to me for a while know my story. I had a, an incredibly life changing event happen, which was my entry point to personal development. Um, had I not had that, it would have been probably a very slow progression. I think I still mm -hmm. would have, have changed, but yeah. Um, it doesn't have to be you. You don't have to fall flat on your face. You can. Right. You, you don't need have, the brick. Right, 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 right. You don't have to have the brick thrown at you. Or you don't have to have like any kind of rock bottom. You can you can mm -hmm. start this process by learning bit by bit, brick by brick. <laughs> whisper by whisper. <laughs> right, exactly. So thank you so much for being here. Oh, um, it's an again, honor. Thank you for having me. LiveBrazen.com forward slash gift, or you can go simply to your kick -ass life forward slash 34, and we'll have other links Thanks for, for Amy Pearson's stuff. And until next time, everybody, we'll see you around for episode 35. Thank you so much for being here. If you get a chance, please go to the podcast on iTunes and leave a rating and review. And I would so appreciate that so, so, so much, so much. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.